As the COP28 UN Climate Change Summit goes into the final weekend, we're going to focus on one issue that's been overlooked in the midst of the talks over the future of fossil fuels. That is deforestation and how to stop or at least slow it than the current pace. Well, one of the silver linings of many clouds is the decline of deforestation, the slowing of it in the Amazon, the so-called lungs of the world. There's a global fund being set up by the Brazilian president to help protect forests worldwide. Countries have started to donate at the summit, including the US, the UK. We're going to bring you the story of a Kenyan activist for perspective, just been recognised as one of the most influential women on the planet, following the footsteps of her Nobel Peace Prize winning mother, empowering women by planting of trees. Wanjira Mathai joins me on the programme from Dubai. Well, I'll start by congratulating you as being one of the top 100 most influential women on the planet, as named by the BBC. Well, let's go from the root to the fruit of, of your story and essentially carrying on your, your mother's legacy. That's right. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, a privilege, really, to bask in her light. As I say, she was a champion of Africa's forests, of global forests, and actually the fact that they are the life support systems. They're, they're lungs of the planet, but they're even more than that. They're the ones that ensure our rivers continue to flow, that we continue to have the biodiversity that serves us for food and medicine. They are literally everything to us. Now, you lead the Green Belt movement that was set up by uh, Wangari Matha, your mother. She won the Peace, Bowl, and the Peace Prize, I should say, in 2004. Um, given that you now have an honour to your name as your influence, tell us about the movement and tell us about, you know, fast forward to now, the work that you're trying to do at Dubai, because a lot of our talk, a lot of focus within the news is about the shift from fossil fuels, but less perhaps on the urgent need to stop deforestation. Well, it's all included. You know, the, the, the Greenbelt movement is a grassroots movement that started mobilizing local communities to restore their landscapes, to restore their farms, to ensure that they're more productive for food, that they have family level food security. One of the things that's extremely inspiring about movements like that and others that have sprouted around the world is that it is about local action. Climate action is local. And a lot of the gaps that we are seeing even here in Dubai around the discussions, the ambition gap, the implementation gap, the finance gap, all of these gaps come down in the final analysis to local action. So it's movements like these, leaders like these, who, will, who are at the forefront and the frontliners in the movement. So it is about fossil fuels, yes, and all the discussions we're going to hear in the final analysis, how do communities cushion themselves against the worst impacts of climate change comes down to our forests, our landscapes, our food systems. And that's why all of those are on the table here in Dubai. Now, we've heard about headlines since uh, President Lula in Brazil took over from Jair Bolsonaro, the slowing of some of the it's a very difficult area, the, the legal mining going on in the, the Amazon. Tell us about the reality of the situation now, where we are in a health check for the planet, deforestation in Kenya, in Africa, and, you know, realistically, what can be achieved from this COP summit? You know, the, the deforestation situation, yes, we are really privileged that we have leadership now in Brazil that is protecting the forest. And we have a lot of work to do, not only to put in place the sort of protective policies that will protect the Amazon, but also to look at some of the drivers of that deforestation. We know that the consumption patterns in the north, in the northern part of the U.S., is part, in, in Northern America, is part of what is driving the deforestation of the Amazon. So the consumption of soya, of beef, all of that is, is related. So we need to look at both the demand and the supply side so that the forest itself is, is conserved not only by those in Brazil, but also by shifting what is driving the deforestation. The same can be said of the, of the Congo Basin in Africa, of other forests on the African continent. It is the policies that will protect them, the communities that have for years cushioned these forests but also the trade and, and the extraction that is happening. One of the most exciting opportunities that we are starting to see is that of inclusive trade. How do we work 
to economically empower communities so that these forests become sources of protection and, and havens of biodiversity and not of extraction that is predatory. And many African countries have continued to play on the commodity side of value chains that are extractive. But economic empowerment can come from playing higher up the supply chain, processing some of those raw materials into, and then generating the sort of wealth that will cushion communities against the worst impacts of climate. Now, it's worth reminding viewers, uh, uh, I, you have been through resistance and continue to in your movement. Your mother went through authorities that were very aggressive towards her and her legacy stands at she saved forests that you still walk through in Kenya because she fought her ground. You've talked about more than 50 million trees being planted by people inspired by your mother and now your movement. Tell us about the resistance you face now. I mean, we talk about oil, we often talk about China, Saudi Arabia. Where's the resistance coming from that you still feel needs convincing? No, I th that's really important what you say because the work that they did at that time, that protecting green spaces, what seemed extremely um, difficult work is now something that we all appreciate. The largest urban forest in Africa is right there in Nairobi, a, a product of activism that the Greenbelt Movement and others like her did. Today we are looking at how we ensure that these resources are, in, are informing the growth and the protection of local communities. Some of the resistance we're having is fair and equal access to trade and markets and finance that will allow us to build the sort of economic muscle that will not only cushion communities but also reduce their reliance on raw materials and fuel, biomass fuel from forests. So we need to move people up the economic value chain so that they too move up the energy value chain, for example, and not rely on biomass, instead go up the value chain. So it is about building economic muscle. That's the battle we are on now around trade, E equal access to finance, equal access to markets, so that there's the sort of inclusive transformation for both people and planet. There'll be people listening, to finally, a brief point from you, thinking, OK, well, this is down to the government's being persuaded, what can I do? And what would your message be to people thinking that? I'm aware that people listening thinking, you're taking your time to answer, I should say. There is a slight delay to get to you. But, yeah, what is your message to people to, to think, actually, this is bigger than we are? Well, it has to be bigger than we are because the alternative is unacceptable. We are facing an existential crisis. The climate crisis today in my own country, 150,000 people have been displaced by floods. We lost 50 people to the uh, flooding in Tanzania. This is about life as we know it right now. And we know we have the solutions within our reach, the finance too, if there was the political will to mobilize it. But what we must do is continue to put pressure on our local governments and our local situations to build, to invest in local action. Ultimately, the adaptation and our ability to survive food security is all going to be local. Global pressure will continue, but local action is where it's going to be. Wanjira, delight to talk to you. Thank you. Wanjira Mathai, the Kenyan environmentalist and one of the most influential women on the planet, according to the BBC.